Hello, everybody. I'm Krista Salamandra, Associate Professor of Anthropology from CUNY. Um, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Walter Armbrust, a uh, lecturer in, fa in the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford, um, and the Albert Harani Fellow at St. Anthony's College. And his paper is entitled Beards and Uniforms, Political Bricolage and the Egyptian Revolution. See. Oh, there we go. Yeah, um, so right, the, that's not actually the title of my paper. This happens often when you have to send an abstract before you write the paper. The real title of my paper appears on the PowerPoint slide. Uh, however, my goal didn't change completely. I did intend from the beginning for one of the main planks of my paper to be an essay on the actor Adli Mam in the January 25th revolution. <clears throat> Throughout a career that now stretches to about five decades, Imam usually acted in comedies, though he did cross over into action films, social realism, and a fair number of political works advocating anti-Islamist and generally pro-regime narratives, particularly in the last two decades. He started acting in the 1960s, became a dominant star from around the mid-1970s to the mid-1990s. And after that, he became a bit less dominant in commercial cinema uh, and TV, partly due to age and partly because of the increasingly fractured mediascape, which permits people to gravitate to what they like rather than consume what's available. Not that he became obscure, it's just that now, rather than being the undisputed number one box office king, he's just a big fish, but not the only one in a much larger media sea than when he first started his career. And I should mention that throughout these five decades, the really dominant stars worked in all media, cinema, television, and the theater. And Imam starred in a string of plays, each of which ran for years, and all of which were filmed and broadcast repeatedly on television. And he also appeared in numerous Musal Salat dramatic serials, some of which are considered memorable. I'd wanted to write about him since almost the beginning of the revolution when I encountered a little snippet of graffiti in April 2011 while walking through the neighborhood of Bulak Abu Ayla, not far from Tahrir Square, but in a very different social milieu. Basically, Bulak is, is a poor, mostly 19th and early 20th century neighborhood that will at some point in the not too distant future uh, be completely erased to make way for expensive and socially exclusive development. The graffito itself isn't spectacular, it's just words. Adli Mam is the biggest pimp in the world, it says. I initially took that as a straightforward commentary on Imam politics, which had been very pro-regime, um, again, since at least the mid-1990s, when he enlisted in that decade's version of the Great War on Terror Against Islamism. The rhetoric then strongly echoed the current demonization of the Muslim Brotherhood in some ways, and in other ways was distinct. While the current political policy differentiates the Muslim Brotherhood from some other types of Islamists, mandating the arrest of predominantly Brotherhood members, and certainly not their erstwhile Salafi allies, at least not systematically, fictionalized media portrayals of Islamists from the 1990s up until the present usually pursue precisely the opposite tactic. The Muslim Brotherhood is rarely named as such. The media campaign is against Islamism, often conflating characters who mark their bodies Islamically with beards for men and hijabs for women with violence and extremism in both the social and religious spheres. The other end of my oddly ma'am revolution experience was a musalsal, um, a dramatic serial broadcast just after Mohammed Morsi was deposed by the military, but obviously in production throughout the year of Morsi's rule. This was Al-Araf, the oracle, 
which my paper presents as an allegory of Mubarak, or at least of Mubarakism. It's the story of a swindler who paradoxically helps and enriches everyone around him. It's set and filmed throughout the country, in Port Said, Alexandria, Mansoor, and Cairo, uh, and Luxor. The man has five children by five different women, each representing a different social type, wealthy, poor, male, female, part of the security state, enmeshed in the informal economy, politicized, apolitical, deeply religious, or effectively agnostic. Those are the children. The premise is that the swindler, a man of numerous stolen identities, has been obliged to disappear from the lives of his ex-wives and children who barely know him. He comes back wanting to know his children before he dies. And the 30 episodes tell the story of how each of the children came to love their father and call him Baba, just as people used to refer to Mubarak, usually ironically, as Baba, um, father. The man's crimes turn out to be not what they seemed. In fact, they're just clever ways of dealing with difficult circumstances. No good person's ever hurt by Baba. Only those who deserve to get cheated get cheated. It was an extraordinary endorsement of patrimonialism and tied to politics in a relatively subtle way without ever really screaming, this is Mubarak, love him. Between the graffito in Bulak in 2011 and the pro-Mubarak Mulsalsal in 2013, Adli Mam popped in and out of the news and in and out of my consciousness. My main agenda in this paper is to think about how an intrinsically mass-mediated phenomenon such as Adli Mam cross-cuts multiple planes of political and social significance in the actual world. Basically, I'm tracing a path from this graffito that, that, this, that disgraced Adli Mam, um, which I photographed in 2011, to Adli Mam's Moselso allegory of patrimonial Mubarakism broadcast in 2013, just after Morsi was removed from the presidency. In traversing the distance between the graffito and the Mosalso, I'm touching on a lot of different issues. Characteristics of the urban fabric in which references to Adli Imam occurred, the trajectory of the revolution and the counter-revolution, coherent narratives, fragmentary allusions to other more distant narratives, and relations between phenomena and objects that are tied together both through abstract concepts like politics, political economy, and media, as well as through relations of contiguity in space and time. I won't belabor you with a overly lengthy presentation of the conceptual apparatus for my paper. That will, in any case, be greatly reduced in later drafts. The salient points are these. First, a revolution could be understood as a liminal crisis following Victor Turner's notion of the ritual process. In other words, we can think of a revolution as a liminal space from which there is no exit back into some form of social convention, whether you think of it as a habitus or a social structure. A liminal crisis is somewhat similar to what political scientists and sociologists call a revolutionary situation, a moment of fluidity in which new political alliances can be made. But the approach in political science and in most analyses of politics is to focus on the political contention between organized groups and the state that takes place in the revolutionary situation. Whereas a liminal crisis is more general and more analytically flexible. So that's one way of opening up a space within which I can follow connections of Adli Mam with phenomena that aren't specifically related to his status within a media scape. Secondly, looking at Adli Mam within frameworks of politics or media can't quite capture how Adli Mam emerges in actual or social space. If you start out asking questions about how Adli Mam fits within the media scape or how he functions as a political symbol, you inevitably end up with answers that fit within those frameworks. We have the phrase Facebook revolution, which now seems like a cruel joke to remind us of the dangers of focusing too tightly on an instance of mass mediation within fields of media and politics. So what I'm trying to do with Adli Mam is consider his position not only within politics and media, but also in terms of relations of contiguity that only emerge through experience. And to do this, I'm evoking the metaphor of the rhizome that Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari made famous. I won't elaborate on that here. There's plenty of elaboration in the paper. The basic idea is that real links between phenomena don't necessarily occur on the same planes as the analytical frameworks with which we normally conjure. 
They have a formidable, I mean, Deleuze and Guattari have a formidable terminological apparatus for conceptualizing other forms of pattern connections, multiplicities, assemblages, plateaus, bodies without organs, intensities, flows, just to name a few. I have no intention of deploying their terminology rigorously, but I do find the idea that phenomena are connected by relations of contiguity in both time and space to be productive, as opposed to connecting them by reference to systems that transcend actual experience. Obviously, this means that my oddly ma'am will be different from anyone else's oddly ma'am, and this is exactly the point of Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy. It's meant to be a philosophy of difference that distrusts abstractions of all possible experience in favor of actual experience. Trying to understand oddly ma'am only in terms of actual experience, however, is limiting. But the debacle of the Facebook revolution idea perhaps stands as a warning against the opposite tendency. Hence, my own approach is cheerfully eclectic, I confess. One can certainly understand that oddly ma'am, one can understand oddly ma'am straightforwardly as both a phenomenon intrinsically created by mass mediation and as a political symbol deployed in the actual world. The image you're seeing now shows oddly ma'am in a revolutionary blacklist poster in Tahrir Square. This was a few months after I photographed the graffito on 26th of July Street in Bulak. In this case, he appears with an assemblage of cultural figures who are being denounced as Mubarak regime tools. Imam is front and center in the assemblage. The poster, which was laid out on the ground during a demonstration, identifies them as the first to stand against the people's revolution and denounces them for leaving a legacy of poverty, ignorance, sickness, sectarianism, and humiliation. It's only contiguous to the graffito in Bulak through my own experience, but the poster and the graffito are pretty clearly expressing the same sentiment and make perfectly good sense also as phenomena within abstracted fields of mass media and politics. Another instance of oddly ma'am occurred in a different location, less directly political or perhaps structured more by counter-revolutionary sentiments than by formal attempts to articulate contentious politics. In 2013, just before the removal of Mohamed Morsi from office, I was looking at used books in a storeroom in Babi Sharia, it's a popular neighborhood um, in a different part of town, or more or less, really, we were just looking at books in an alleyway where there's more space and light than in the cramped and chaotic machzan of the, uh, the guy that I buy old paper from. Another of my book dealer's customers turned out to be a television producer, not a high flyer by any means, really a kind of miskin muazzaf, a low-level employee of the private Dream TV channel. And he was researching oddly ma'am for a master's thesis, and I encountered him poring over popular magazines looking for tidbits of information on his subject. Since I've long been interested in Imam's works, we struck up a conversation, and in the course of it, he took me back to my graffito in Bulak, informing, that there, informing me that there had been a TV interview early in the revolution in which Imam had pointedly insulted the people of Bulak for having betrayed Mubarak and supported the revolution. So my graffito was not, in fact, an expression of the general atmosphere of the time, but rather a specific answer to something that Imam had said. And that set the stage for further rhizomes, sending out tendrils to other contiguous phenomena. One was the conversation that took place immediately after my talk with the, with the Dream TV producer. Our talk about Adli Imam led to a discussion of his politics, and then the revelation, to me anyway, of the specific link between Imam and the graffito in Bulak. And since we were talking about media and politics, I changed the subject slightly and asked their opinions about Bassem Yusuf, the John Stewart-like comedian, who by that time was hugely prominent due to his hilarious mocking of Mohamed Morsi, who was still then the sitting president. This was March 2013, about three months before the Tamaru demonstration that led to the toppling of Morsi. To my surprise, the book vendor, who I knew to be absolutely and implacably opposed to Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, launched into a vitriolic attack, not on Morsi, but on Bassem Yusuf. Why? Because he didn't respect the authority of his elders and, and of his betters. Bassem Yusuf, as a disastrous exemplar for youth, in the opinion of my bookseller, was temporarily elevated even above Mohammed Morsi as a target of his invective. The book vendor and the Dream TV employee further connected me to an additional phenomenon, namely a kind of serial form of expressing opinions. The Dream TV employee was a conduit 
to the book vendor to for, for the book vendor to appear on TV, basically on a sports a sports chat show, um, broadcast very late at night, and they chatted about all sorts of things other than sports. In one of his appearances on this show, the book vendor appeared with a stack of film pamphlets and gift posters of movie stars that used to be given out with magazines in the 1930s and 1940s. And he proceeded to tell his own version of the revolution on air in a very anti-youth and pro-Mubarak narrative, all told through the medium of film titles. Hikaya min biladna, kid fi kid, morsi folk, morsi taht, na'bil am, akhir man yalam. A story from our country is lies upon lies, morsi up, morsi down, the public prosecutor. And each time he would say one of these things, he'd hold up um, one of his uh, film pamphlets and sort of give a little grin um, in front of the camera. Um, it's too long to go through the whole thing. I mean, I put it up on the PowerPoint slide and you can browse through it. Suffice it to say that the gist of it was that the story ends with a strong ruler kicking ass on the impudent kids who started the revolution and restoring order. The patrimonial sentiment strongly echoed oddly Mam's patrimonial musalsal, which was still a few months from being broadcast, and which I should add the book vendor openly admired when it was. The way he told his story about his appearance on Dream TV, on the Dream TV sports show, um, sent a line, at least for me, back to Bullock. The Dream TV producer had mentioned that Adli Mam had specifically insulted the people of Bullock in an interview. I couldn't find the interview on YouTube, but I did locate a YouTube video that showed the people of Bulak parading down 26th of July Street, just down the street from my graffito, carrying a poster that denounced Adli Mam in exactly the same fashion uh, as the book vendor had used in his revolution narrative rendered in classic film titles. Bulak Abu Ella declares a war of words against Al Halfut, Al Mutasawul, and Al Mashbuh for what he said about us on television. Al Halfut is the lazy bum, Al Mutasawul the beggar, Al Mashbuh the suspect. They're all titles of Adli Imam films. Um, moreover, from a period in Imam's career when his work was structured by a quasi political critique of the widening gap between rich and poor, exacerbated by the free market policies pursued by Sadat and then later by Mubarak. This was before Adli Imam became essentially a shill for the Mubarak regime, starting with his enlisting in the campaign against Islamists and later extending to an implicit extolling of the regime's achievements instantiated in the plush, gated suburban communities that had been the setting for many of Imam's recent films. And this brings me back to my starting point. Bulak, the location of my anti-Imam graffito, is a neighborhood doomed by the very neoliberal economic policies that Imam now champions in his films in Mosel Salat. The neighborhood is walled off from the surrounding city, including nearby Tahrir Square. The traffic has been routed so that you almost can't walk through Bulak um, or to it, and you can really only drive a car from it by entering ramps to raised highways that whisk passengers to distant neighborhoods, the sort of gated communities where Imam's films are now set. Ultimately, Bulak will be torn down entirely to make way for high-priced and socially exclusive developments. The residents of the area have fought a spirited rearguard action against these developments, but in the end, they will lose. Meanwhile, the area is carved up by anti-pedestrian streets that can only be described as traffic sewers, walled off on one side by an iron fence, and its main thoroughfare is covered by a traffic flyover, a raised highway, extremely noisy and totally inaccessible from below. The building on which the graffito was written was the South Cairo Company for Electrical Distribution, a holding company that's supposed to prepare the way for privatization of the electrical grid. It's, uh, it is subject to constant strikes by its employees for better salaries and working conditions, though of course their ultimate fates will be determined by policies designed to shrink the workforce. My anti-Imam graffito was not the only political message inscribed on the building. A bit further down the street, the Muslim Brotherhood had fixed a constellation of posters. Your dream is our dream. Your delusion is our concern. The Muslim Brotherhood, we bring good to all people. It was a campaign poster for an election on which there were no agreed parameters in April 2011. The posters were an index of the then warm relations between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Military Council, which also favored early elections as a means for closing off the ongoing liminal chasm that the revolution had opened. 
Following the logic of contiguity, contiguity traced by rhizomatic tendrils, it must be noted that the military was part of the graffito's surroundings. The pillars on the traffic flyover that makes normal movement impossible in Bulak had been painted in a patriotic pastiche of the Egyptian flag and a camouflage design in honor of the military's self-proclaimed proclaimed role in saving the revolution. These pillars march right by the South Cairo Electrical Distribution Company building where the anti-imam graffito had been written. Almost done. And finally, at the other end of this road, on the day that I was there, one encountered a demonstration. On that particular day, it wasn't a demonstration against the electrical company. It was against the corruption of the Traffic Violations Bureau. That was perhaps fitting, given that traffic forms the primary prison walls that isolate Bulak from its surroundings to the benefit of the small number of Kyrenes who can afford private automobiles. And that's where I'll leave you. It's just a few meters away from where I started with the graffito that constituted um, the beginning of my talk. Obviously, its distance is rather greater if one insists on considering Adli Mam strictly as an element in a mediascape. By taking such a circuitous route from the graffito to the demonstration, I've tried to suggest that there are benefits to following phenomenological lines that don't necessarily fit within preset categories such as media and politics. Or to put it differently, our understanding of our conventional categories are enhanced by also being attentive of these lines of contiguity in the actual and virtual spheres of media and politics. Thank you. I know, yeah. Our next presenter is Tarek Alaris, and the title of this presentation is The Dark Side of the Arab Spring, Literature, Violence, and the Virtual. Okay, perfect. Hello, thank you. Um, this, uh, what you see here, the, the image you see here is um, a hacking of the Lebanese power company, the Ministry of Energy, in April uh, 2012. Um, and the hackers transformed the cursor into a flashlight. So as you move with your cursor, it kind of, uh, it lights up a text. Uh, so they transformed, so it's a, it's a hacking to protest the lack of services that the ministry and all ministries, I mean, all, pretty much the entire government websites were hacked. Uh, by kind of the Lebanese offshoot of Anonymous. And, and, and here what I found interesting is that they created the situation when the power goes out uh, in the act of hacking itself. And they substituted the text. So here the text is really about uh, protesting government policy. So what we find here is, is creating this kind of this darkness, uh, but also creating the possibility of, of substituting the text of the ministry website by a text that is also uh, protesting its, its inadequate uh, ability to provide for people. And one of the things that I'm you know, interested in in, in in this paper today and, and as part of a larger project is precisely how writing and how hacking, how certain forms of, of code, writing code, effective writing, really are not just simply an attempt to silence and to crash a site, but really are about uh, introducing new writing practices and introducing new aesthetics, which is here, not simply we have a different text, but also there is a cursor that's telling us also how to read it. So there is also a training about how to read this text, how to shed light on it. So what, what my talk today, which is about how, you know, how um, kind of new forms of interventions or, or um, I'm interested in hacking in, 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 a, particular, uh, in a particular context, um, how they are also not only taking effect in terms of contesting the political, but also introducing new literary practices, reading and writing practices uh, within the context of the Arab Spring, but also the, the Arab uprisings is also a moment that also allow us to read pretty much the last 10, 
15 years in the Arab world as, as also having ushered in new forms of intervening in the political, new forms of writing practices, uh, issues that I've kind of been thinking about and thinking through. So, so, so I'm, the framework of this talk is really to think about this question of, of affects, which I kind of, you know, I've been thinking about in the context of, of modernity or the European encounter or, or the modernity as, as kind of an issue that linked to a discourse on the Nahda in the Arab world or Arab enlightenment from the 19th century onward. So what kind of this, this encounter with, the, with modernity, which is itself a modern encounter, what kind of new writing practices, what kind of new ideas, what kind of new critiques of power did it usher in? So in, in this project that this paper is part of, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in the virtual. I'm interested in cyberspace and, and bringing this conversation in cyberspace and also trying to kind of identify perhaps, uh, I don't want to say paradigm shift, but, but basically transformations that are putting in question uh, a particular enlightenment model, but also a critique of an enlightenment model linked to the public sphere, linked to the Habermas, linked to 18th century development and the Arab encounter with modernity in the 19th century, um, roughly speaking. Of course, this is um, kind of a synopsis. So, so, so to think the public sphere is, is, is really to kind of see where are we from this project uh, that's been kind of consuming Arab thought and, and literary and literary and cultural production for the past 200 years. So where are we from this questions of democracy, questions of secularism, questions of participation, concepts of the community that have really evolved and been in dialogue, comparatively in dialogue with some of, with, the, with this kind of larger historical and political context. So some of the things that I've been thinking through and would like to shed light on um, through a particular case study today involving a Saudi author uh, in Qatar, so involving kind of a case study in, in that's coming from the Gulf, which is, you know, aside from Bahrain, has not also been part of the Arab uprising in a kind of a radical way. Um, so one of the things, one of the issues, or one of the frameworks that I, I want to kind of, I've, I've been exploring and thinking more about, at this moment, especially when the euphoria about the Arab uprisings or the Arab Spring has kind of abated, and there is a moment of also scholarly introspection, if you like, um, is, is, is really to look again at, at, at the internet or, or kind of cyberspace in a more general uh, framework, not so much as a public sphere, but also as, as a site of, of, of regression, as a playground, as a street, as, as, as a site where questions of, of circulations, affect, are, are really brought into the fore in the form of writing, in the form of interaction, that also are ushering in new ways of thinking about knowledge, aesthetics, literature, uh, contestation. Uh, so where are we, for instance, from iltizam or engagement, you know, the kind of the model for you know, literary, engaging, literary engagement of social and political systems from the 50s, especially with the work of um, Hayy Latini, Dries, and, and, and others. So, so what are the new models that allow us to kind of think through these, these kind of contestation practices and what are their aesthetic frameworks? And one of the kind of the, the concepts, and I'm very interested in really thinking through these processes within the Arabic context, of course in dialogue with kind of theoretical frameworks and cultural frameworks, but also to think about them with it in, in Arabic as well. And this is partly um, part of my project or a larger project that this is instance of. So I've been thinking about questions of kashf and mukashafa, some things I've also been thinking about beforehand, unveiling, but also fadh and fadiha, or questions of making a scene, uh, like you know, the act of hacking as in making a scene, the act of, you know, tagging 20 people and a sign is like an act of lem, you know, it's an act of bringing people into an object of knowledge. 
Um, but also, in this particular case, the one I will be talking about, this notion of ghazwa and maghza, this notion of raiding in order to establish meaning. So how, how is meaning, how, how are certain forms of um, signification or, or aesthetics coded in these moments of attacks, but also in these moments of veiling, unveiling, in these moments of intervention. So, so what happens in these moments that allow us to rethink literature, to rethink political, political intervention? So this is, so what, and, and one of the things I would like to think about again is how fiction is recoded or how, how uh, literature in a kind of a general way is, is, is recoded, rewritten, uh, re-signified in these moments of intervention. And, and is it the fact that we are moving outside of a literary context understood in a very kind of traditional sense, the death of the author in Bach or, or uh, so, so, so what I want to suggest is that we're actually entering into a, actually a very hyper-fictional model of interaction where all we have at the end is, is fiction. Fiction is, you know, the author is collapsed with the text. You have, you have to go online. One of the things, you know, I say in the larger kind of piece is that it's almost going online is also entering one's text permanently. It's, it's a total form of entering one's text. So this idea of author's intentionality or, or, or certain literary kind of characteristics that we, normally imagine or associate with, with fiction uh, have also been recoded, redefined. Um, and, and one of the things is I want to also examine is, is how is this part of, or how can we think of these practices as part of uh, Arab Spring uh, or Arab, you know, Arab Spring achievements or, or uprising. So the case study uh, today is comes from uh, Qatar, it comes from uh, a hacked talk, uh, a talk that was uh, scheduled at the University of Qatar for Saudi author and columnist for Al Hayat, Badri Al Bishr, um, um, in May 2012. And uh, this is, has to be kind of seen on, in light of a larger uh, women's activism, you know, women's campaign for driving in Saudi Arabia, and also kind of a, uh, an attempt to, to, to shut these voices down, to, to, to basically can prevent a lot of these women activists from actually occupying uh, a public sphere or occupying uh, certain positions where where they where they express their you know where they express their contestations and this is um, Badri Al Bishr was invited to Qatar University to give a talk about her work, about her activism. She's she's she has a column in Al Hayat, and and a hashtag campaign started two days before the talk that pressured to the university to cancel it. So after she had come to Qatar, ready to actually give her talk, uh, the university uh, caved in to this Twitter campaign uh, that went and accused Al-Bishr of being blasphemous, went and got these passages from her uh, novel, Hind and the Soldiers, Hind al Askar, where this little girl talks about her mother as being cruel or severe, and then that cruelty represented what God, God's cruelty, or, or it, was the, it was the fear of, of God's anger that appeared on the mother's face. So, so, so there was this campaign against Al Bishr, and and that actually led to the cancellation of the talk based on certain passages that were circulating uh, online that constituted the proof of her uh, blasphemy. And then, you know, the the people who participated in the campaign, some of them were professors and students at the university, but also at Qatar University. But some of them were from outside, were saying, you know, we should not allow, we should not give uh, uh, room for this this person, this this liberal uh, Masonic, the accuser of Masonic, this this agent of the West, to come and insult Islam and in a in a in a public in a university setting. So when the university canceled the talk the day, you know, right few hours beforehand, um, Al Bashir eventually described what happened to her as uh, a hashtag Ghazwa, 
غزوة هاشتاج تقودها قوى ظلامية منعت محاضرتي في جامعة قطر so, uh, هاشتاج غزوة led by forces of darkness uh, leads to the cancellation of my talk and then she eventually says well one of the issues here is that it's trying an actor for a role she played uh, so there is, she says all these people cannot read literature. So one of the things she ends up saying is that they can't read literature. So this, this hashtag Ghazwa is linked, is, is also about contesting a certain understanding of literature or of a separation between the, the author and her text. Uh, and and the, the passages that were circulating really are part of this kind of reading this attack. How did this uh, campaign start? Uh, so you have here this mobilization that starts on Twitter, this, this uh, mobilization that encourages, uh, you know, with the hashtag, no to Badria al-Bashir, Lali Badria, uh, that encourages people to, to join, that describes the campaign as Nashit, Nashat, also Nashit, activist, uh, that in order to avenge a slighted God. So the idea is that she's, the blasphemous Badri al-Bashir here says, this is not about uh, Qatar alone, this is about the entire nation, uh, and we need to avenge God for what this, this uh, author, this disobedient daughter, Aqa, uh, this, uh, this uh, agent of the West is, is doing. So, so here we have, and then you have this repetition, this kind of almost tribal mobilization as a way of, of uh, you know, Getting support for this for this uh, for this kind of campaign, and here you have the language of of war. Shabab Qatar yashunun hamla. So so they are waging. Shanna yashunu is also to wage to wage war, and hamla is 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 a campaign in, in a kind of also a military context. Oh my God. Okay. So so one of the things that I I. I was thinking about here is that this, no, this, this rhetoric of Ghazwa and Ghazwa, which is really a deep anxiety in the context, in the kind of Arabic uh, cultural context of, of Arabia especially, is, is activated here as, as a Twitter campaign. As a Twitter campaign that, that, uh, that not only crashes the talk that leads to its cancellation, but also that is experienced as a raid, as a tribal raid. As a, but that tribal raid is also an attempt to determine the maghza of the text, to determine the meaning of the text and the meaning of literature uh, by recoding it, by circulating, circulating it in a, in a particular way. So the ghazwa itself and, and the moment, the incursion, the ghazwa is really an intervention, a violent intervention through which the meaning of the text is also interpreted. Um, and here, you know, I'm thinking also of, of this notion of, of hashtagging because I'm really interested in how, um, you know, how, how knowledge is produced or how literature becomes meaningful or the text becomes meaningful. And, and one of the things that uh, the, the hashtag here becomes a form of branding, becomes a form of ganging up as well. So it's not just simply a form of bringing people into uh, into uh, making something discursive by by bringing it into discourse, Lali Badri al Bishop, that is what needs to be known and understood and brought into that site. So there is something very spatial about this metaphor of, of knowledge that also involves a particular kind of branding, a wasm in Arabic, that is also linked to. Um, to to Ghazu, so to coming into that space, into that spot, or or or, or mobilizing in order to um, protest a particular talk here is also a march. It's also a campaign, a hamla that is operating also in cyberspace. So this knowledge, the idea of knowledge production here, the the meaning of the text, the effects of this campaign in terms of. You know whether the author gets to speak, gets arrested, gets the, all the physical implication of this campaign here are both epistemological and and physical uh, at the same time. Um, and these are the the passages from from her texts the, where the little girl in her in her novel is is talking about the image of her mom and and as being angry and and that somehow replicating God's anger, and and what's even more important here so within this context 
the question of gender becomes really important because really when they have activated this kind of archaic jahiliya or archaic pre-Islamic uh, uh, landscape of of ghazu, of tribal warfare, uh, they also activated within the same context this notion of wa'd al-banat and the idea of the girl that's buried alive, which used to be a practice that supposedly Islam came and put an end to it. So what we have here is that she is reduced as part of this campaign to the position of the child who is prevented from speaking. So the reading, the intervention, the campaign is also a recording of the text in a very archaic, jahili context, where the author is reduced to the child in her novel who is prevented from speaking as a mau'uda, as the girl buried alive in jahili time. So here, the gender component is fundamental to the way we understand these forms of intervention outside of liberal and conservative, fundamentalist, and so on. So here there is a jahili fantasy that is allowing us through cyberspace, opening a portal into jahiliya, not so much as, as a violent era, but also as a literary fantasy, as a fantasy that is now kind of coming in through uh, cyberspace, redefining literature, and bringing us back to um, to its 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 uh, tribal model and so on. So, and what's interesting again is that this campaign was hailed as an act of democratic triumph. And this is what's interesting is that precisely this this jahili fantasy is 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 hailed as a, a sign or or as the achievement of an Arab Spring where a new youth culture now is rising against certain societal models and no longer accepting to be talked to, to, be, to, be imp to have things imposed on them, and so on. So how is this you know, fantasmatic context is also being hailed as a democratic achievement by a new generation? And this is where kind of not only the text is recorded, by the, but the Arab Spring itself is recorded as an uprising that's supposed to represent a new youth culture using social media or using new communication in, in kind of revolutionary ways. Um, so basically, this is um, what, what I want to say is that we're entering into this kind of hyperfictional context where the author is you know reading her text bringing anxieties about the little girl burning or being afraid of fire from the text and actualizing it through trying to kind of uh, prevent this author from speaking and and, the, and and by bringing in this kind of jahili this this kind of archaic this fantasy of a jahiliya into into this modern context and i will stop here thank you Our next presentation is from Leila Tayeb, who is a PhD student at, at the Department of Performance Studies at Northwestern University. And the title of her presentation is Shahi al Huriya, Militant Optimism and Freedom Tea. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Marwan and Marina for including me in this rich symposium. Many here are likely familiar with these two lines from the Tunisian poet Abul Qasim Shabbi. إذا الشعب يوما أراد الحياة فلا بد أن يستجيب القدر. If the people wanted life one day, destiny would have to answer. I begin with this quintessentially utopian declaration because it succinctly points to the twin elements of determination and unlikelihood that will be thematic to my discussion. In other words, a primary contention of this paper is that utopia is not easy. Rather than fantasy that allows for a disengagement from the political, the understanding of utopianism that I employ here is inextricable from a critique of the material constraints of the present. This is, in Jose Munoz's words, a critical investment in utopia, which is nothing like naive, but instead profoundly resistant to the stultifying temporal logic of a broken down present. Following Munoz's seminal deployment of hope, as in his words, both a critical affect and a methodology, 
In what follows, I trace utopian impulses and musical performance of performances of the 2011 Libyan Revolution. These performances provide generative sites at which to investigate the conjunction of revolutionary hopeful impulses and material change. They compel us to take pause, to resist the prevailing tendency to jump past the revolution to its aftermath, evident in the question that began to, dis to dominate some discussions almost immediately, was it worth it? I propose that close readings of the revolution's aesthetic performances can provide a methodology for coming closer to taking the revolution on its or the revolutions on their own terms. This, in turn, helps to better illuminate the critical potentialities of which the revolutionaries were themselves conscious. The performance examples that I take up illustrate what Ernst Bloch calls militant optimism. This phrasing provides a particularly visceral avenue for comprehending the kind of grounded utopianism that undergirds a project that follows Munoz and Bloch. In his multi-volume masterwork, The Principle of Hope, Bloch defines his concept of militant optimism as, in his words, materially comprehended hope, the grounded process of changing the world in the work of revolution. Militant optimism for Bloch is conscious. It requires non-contemplative non knowledge, a kind of knowledge that goes with process and thus, in his words, thoroughly mobilizes the subjects of conscious production itself. Militant optimism is optimism that does not retreat from present material conditions. This approach to utopia, as I've said, is not a project of escapism or of the kind of dreaming that is detached from the constraints of the current world. Militant optimism is relentless. It insists on reaching toward the glimmers of what can't yet be imagined without unfastening itself from the struggles at hand. In the longer version of this paper, I examine three performances which illustrate different facets of militant optimism. Today I'll focus on just one, but I'll introduce the others here in case we want to incorporate them in a broader discussion. The first is a March 2011 performance of Shayat Horia, Tea of Freedom. This one provides an improvised remake of a Gaddafi era song that enables audience members to collectively reimagine the current moment through the shared memory of a political past. The second, an English, an English language studio recording that translates Omar Mukhtar's, um, uh, that translates Omar Mukhtar to produce the title and chorus, We Will Not Surrender, We Win or We Die narrates the revolution to Anglophone listeners in and outside Libya while it generates multifarious meanings in its local and transnational circulations and offers a pedagogy for how to live in and through the affective extremes of revolution. The third, Adam Shethi's Sofa Nab Kahuna, We Will Stay Here, articulates national resistance in language that travels and in its circulation acquires localized significances that affectively link the varied political struggles, struggles of Arabic speakers. Distinct in their production, distribution, audience, and language, each of the performances I reference here includes an element of bravado. One could locate this performance of bravado in the very grammar of these songs' texts. A simple future spoken as a collective, we will, or an imperative. I argue, however, that while the performance of bravado in this music is certainly among its most important affective dimensions, it is not an expression of confidence. Seemingly self-assured, these singers perform not certainty, but insistence. This kind of bravado produces a tactical affect and a performative threat that renders the popular uprising a force to be reckoned with. The appearance of confidence belies the unfavorable odds with which this movement must contend, drawing sympathetic listeners in toward an unarticulated political project, which nonetheless, through the tone, seems like it could win. I'm going to play a little bit of a clip that doesn't have any translation, but I'll go back and do a really close reading of it, so that should kind of mitigate for those of you who don't understand the Arabic. Uh-oh, can I have volume? I think the mute is off. Any other volume buttons? Yeah. Are you guys doing it up there? Yes. <laughs> I'm not touching it. <laughs> Something's happening. Oh, that would make 
makes sense. around a large pot of steaming liquid. Most stand, while a few, closer to the camera through which the scene is recorded and uploaded to YouTube, sit. Some hold paper, no, that one, <laughs> hold on. Some hold paper or plastic cups. One man, seated and dressed in a bright yellow windbreaker, raises a water bottle that has been cut across the middle to form a cup. A man standing in the center of the group leads a call and response, moving with large gestures and rotating to direct his enthusiasm to each part of the circle. Occasionally he glances into the camera, but mostly he seems focused on directing his attention at the people around him. Their movements are generally more muted, but they smile if they don't always sing, and they look as though they are just as amused by the T-man, Amen's delight as by the song itself. Amen grins and sings, Yeshay al Horia. O T of freedom, the chorus surrounding him responds in wordless melody, and you can join me. Yella la 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 li. Nobody. Okay. <laughs> Amen sings Ya Ghali Aliya. O you who is so dear to me, and the chorus responds again. This is Ben Ghazi, March 2011, a few weeks after the Battle of the Katiba resulted in the evacuation of the city by Muammar Gaddafi's forces near the end of February. In the background of the video, street lamps are visible, though unlit as it is day, and two tall buildings lay far behind the group. A wall closer to the foreground is covered in orange cloth behind black and white photographs of faces. I'm still not sure of the scene's exact location, but the walls look like ones that were set up outside of Benghazi's courthouse at that time. Impromptu collective mourning sites where families placed images of the dead and disappeared. The walls I saw when I visited months later were somehow sim simultaneously two- and three-dimensional, flat in the fadedness and somber tones of the, photo of the photos and in the absences they implied, yet also overflowing in the sheer number of images squeezed next to and stacked on top of each other. Many retained thick frames that suggested that they had not long before occupied a central position in someone's living room. As Amen sings, the other men catch on and sing the lines with him. They all know the song, or they almost do. It has been cleverly adapted from an older ode to Gaddafi called Leader of Our Revolution. In Arabic, the names of the original and revised songs rhyme. The rhythm and melody are unchanged in the ode to T to make the parody clear. Leader of Our Revolution praises Gaddafi in his green book, the manifesto most of you know he claimed as a philosophical basis for his rule since its publication in 1975. The mixed male and female chorus sings that they, or we, it's ambiguous in, in the Arabic, are living, in, are living freedom through the popular voice and assures the leader that the hearts of millions love him. The rhythm and melody of the song are in popular Libyan style, making it incongruously danceable despite its obvious propaganda. Thank you. 
Is it possible to keep the images going and keep the sound muted? This is much easier on a Mac. The main punch of the song is changed dramatically in the revision through the replacement of only two words. In the original, the chorus sings, O leader of our revolution, we are with you all the way. The word, deb, the word derb, path, becomes gabr, grave, and tea of freedom. This renders a refrain with equal urgency. Ya chayin thawritna ala gibrik tawali. O traitor of our revolution, to your grave directly. It is noteworthy that the, that the performers maintain the first half of the line, ya chayid or chayin thawritna, nearly unchanged, and that this offers a place in which to point to the layers of reference at play in this song and in discourse during and about this revolution more broadly. After the 1969 coup in which Gaddafi and about 70 other free officers ousted King Idris, Libya's first post-colonial independence, post-independence leader, Gaddafi fashioned himself the guide of a continuous revolution. Thus, the leader of our revolution still signifies as Gaddafi more than four decades later. Significantly, tea of freedom does not characterize or speak to the new revolution. Anything revolutionary in 2011 Libya rings with the multiple valences of a push for change alongside the institutional, likewise described. Further, by moving from leader of our revolution to traitor of our revolution, the new song claims some ownership over the 1969 revolution, which enjoyed greater popular support in its early years. It moves from an our revolution that renders us his to one, thank you, which implicitly disrupts the persistent elision that tended to merge Libya into Gaddafi. Freedom is only used in the tea song and the refrain. In Leader of Our Revolution, however, it is used more descriptively. The chorus sings, Aishin fil hurriya, fisulta shabiya. We're living in freedom through the rule of the people. This line defines freedom in reference to Gaddafi's philosophy of rule by direct authority of the people. It was through this philosophy that he maintained no official governmental position, an irony through which he argued in 2011 that he could not be overthrown like the leaders of neighboring Tunisia and Egypt. How would he step down if he was not in charge of anything? The people were, per the Green Book, already governing themselves through the absence of representation in political parties. The notion of freedom in the context of Gaddafi era discursive practice is thus deeply ironic cynical in its farce. Part of what I find so compelling about the tea of freedom appropriation is precisely that it does not engage in prescriptive gestures about the revolution or what might come after it, nor does it attempt to define or describe freedom beyond asserting that it includes tea. While a few different video clips of the Benghazi, of a, of the Benghazi performance of Sheikh Hariya exist on YouTube, one in particular has circulated the most widely. This performance video circulated via YouTube, but also in the way that much other archival evidence of the revolution did during 2011 when the internet in Libya was cut and phone lines worked sparsely, passed individual to individual via USB drive. The video was exchanged like the T was, without payment or any apparent structure of ownership. The movement was so extensive that by June 2011, Sheikh Hariya was well known throughout Libya and rumors circulated that the T man had been assassinated by the regime. Sheikh Hariya's widespread circulation among Libyans in 2011 and the investment in the performance evident in the alarm that many expressed at the idea that the T-man had been assassinated suggests the significant power that can be read in it. The performance did not celebrate the realization of any particular goal, besides perhaps sharing tea. It was rather forward-looking, but without prescription. It signaled a push toward a movement that rearticulated the past and could thereby reconfigure potential futures. It was open, insistently so. In that sense, it was hopeful, as Bloch describes hope as openness that is kept open. Offering no definition for the freedom it celebrated and no clear plans other than the demise of the brother leader, it left room. Precisely in not imagining a specific future, Sheikh Hariya was utopian. Munoz writes, utopia can never be prescri prescriptive and is always destined to fail. Sheikh Hariya express, expressed a militant optimism both in its insistent refrain praising the quotidian symbol of tea and in its violence, the delight the performers took in the play on words that would send Gaddafi to his grave. 
It is, despite failures in grappling with real material conditions, militant optimism persists. It is precisely the defeated man who must try the outside world again. The joy expressed by the performers of Shail Hurriya should, should not be mistaken for confidence. There is, as I argued earlier, a certain performance of bravado that one might locate in this and other performances that circulated during the revolution. But this is not the swagger of certainty. Quite conversely, it is something closer to insistence. That phrase that we heard earlier in Omar's talk, we will not surrender, we will win or we will die, also performs this bravado. But it is self-conscious. The chance of disappointment is so pervasive as to be almost comical. All around are those who have already died trying. How can we possibly think that we will not? This is explosive power. This brand of optimism is militant in literal terms. In Libya in 2011, the word jibha, frontline, rapidly moved from a somewhat specialized confer term confined to discussions of wars elsewhere to a word used constantly in daily conversations. Spatial orientations shifted as territory turned from the control of Gaddafi forces to that of the revolutionaries and back again, sometimes repeatedly. The front line was the place from which news was awaited to which huge stocks of food and supplies were sent and to and from which people traveled and returned. The term was used as if it were a steady identifiable location rather than an ever shifting liminal space. The front line was at, fun, was at once physical and affective conceptual terrain. What happened there changed both the conditions under which people lived and their sense of orientation in the space around them. The front line provided the active location for militant optimism. Bloch writes, there is no other place for militant optimism than the place which the category of front opens up. This place is, like the Libyan revolution's jibha, both physical and affective conceptual. It is the edge where the fundamental senses can be reoriented. It is a forward dawning that includes an actual fight. It is based in action. That is to say, militant optimism is violent. It is not utopian to imagine that the Libyan revolution could have been bloodless. This was clear to the knowledge of non-contemplation active in the moment of the revolution and civil war. If Gaddafi's death in, 2000, in October 2011 marked something, it was, in my view, not the barbarism that international media framed it to be. If it marked anything, it was the temporary conclusion of the kinds of utopian impulses that I've described here, those that were particular to this revolution's history and context. It marked, for the moment, the closing of the front. Thank you. And our final presentation is by Edward Zutter, Associate Professor of Theater and History and Chair of the Department of Drama at New York University. And the title of his talk is Syria's Anecdotal Theater. So <clears throat> I've actually changed the title. I um, have decided to focus on one of my case studies, um, and so I'm talking specifically about therapeutic theater in Syria. In the early days of the Syrian uprising, theater practitioners were prominent in organizing the Damascus opposition to escalating violent crackdown. As the uprising gathered steam, theater practitioners were prominent, prominent in the creative resistance moving, movement, filling the air of mediascape with oppositional plays, puppet shows, and video blogs. Now, in the midst of civil war, theater practitioners are working with the victims of government violence and devised pieces that give aesthetic shape to traumatic experience. Some of these works juxtapose diverse wartime experiences and responses to trauma, interspersing the verbatim with the fictional. In doing so, such work aims to restore volition. Refugees become artists, demonstrating an ability to make use of their past experience at the same time that this combination of voices demonstrates varied responses to war. Such therapeutic theater projects extend work that was being done in the years prior to 2011 and built on a long tradition of Syrian political theater. Applied theater, an umbrella term designating performance valued as efficacious as well as aesthetic, has had a brief and difficult history in Syria. As an art form committed to social and personal analysis in public forums, 
it has run afoul of state efforts to police the public sphere. Omar Abu Sada was prominent in Syria's applied theater movement before the uprising and is now creating therapeutic productions with Syrian refugees. By examining one of his specific works, The Trojan Women, I will demonstrate theater's potential to help in the healing of individual and national identities. Therapeutic theater aims to help participants, both actors and audience members, to process trauma. In this case, the trauma of war and forced migration. However, the value of traumatic theater in the context of the Syrian civil war goes beyond restoring individual psychologies and should instead be viewed as an extension of the civil society movement that had preceded and in part prompted the 2011 uprising. At its most basic, all forms of drama therapy rely on the mind's tendency to use metaphor to process traumatic experience in the way that in the same way that Freud argued that the mind converts painful experience into manageable tropes, drama therapy provides participants with the tools to construct images and stories through which participants can access and manage past trauma. In this sense, drama therapy, therapy can, can be described as displacement in reverse, whereby images retrieve rather than sublimate painful experiences. Through projective identification and dramatic distancing, drama therapy participants create new stories that incorporate past experience, inoculating the artist slash patient against the corrosive effects of trauma. Drama therapy is a project of creative remembering, a remembering that psychoanalysis posits at the heart of healing. Um, I, I just want to actually, I mean, where I'm going with this, I'm just conscious of the time. I, I do believe that the study of the psychosexual development uh, provides us with a valuable vocabulary for thinking through processes of national belonging and national imagining. And where the paper hopes to go is to think through how such drama therapy projects in the future can not only restore individual psychologies, but can begin to conceive of a restructuring of the nation. Uh, not just a metaphorical restructuring of the nation, but by taking up ideas of the, of the abject in relationship to the experience of refugees to rethink how nation is formulated within the public imaginary. Um, and then I was going to do this thing on political Syrian theater, but I'll just suffice to say that in the past 50 years, the very best Syrian theater has engaged forbidden topics, critiquing the government's use of surveillance, imprisonment, and torture, analyzing Arab-Israeli relations, drawing attention to Arab repression of Palestinians, debating how ideas of history and heritage have been employed to serve the state, and problematizing even such loaded concepts in, as martyrdom. And in the longer paper, I talk about Abu Sada's training with some of the significant, the seminal figures of political theater um, and the political actions that he took part in as part of his theater training. Um, at a certain point in his training, he turns to Boal's forum theater techniques, uh, which leads directly into his work in drama therapy. Soon after graduating from the High Institute of Theater Arts in 2004, he founds the Studio Theater with other recent graduates and current graduates, and working under the auspices of the United Nations Population Fund, and with logistical support from the Syrian-controlled NGO Firdos, Fund for Integrated Rural Development of Syria, his company, Studio Theater, began staging workshops and productions in the countryside outside Kanaitra, Idlib, Homs, Latakia, and Aleppo. And their theater work addressed polygamy, marital relations, women, poverty, and literacy. And while support of an NGO might seem antithetical to the Syrian government's strict attempts to control public space, such efforts fall under a governing strategy that Stephen Heidemann has termed upgraded authoritarianism. Writing in 2007, Heidemann argued that in response to a growing pressure for greater civil liberties, several Arab governments had attempted to co-opt the rhetoric and structure of the civil society movement, creating domestic NGOs visibly tied to and led by regime elites, but, and consequently lacking any autonomy. Such NGOs could be used to exclude or control 
Western financed NGOs. Uh, in Syria, for example, the president's wife was the official sponsor of the nation's seven major domestic NGOs, all of which were centralized within the Syrian Trust for Development. Now, Abu Sada's work um, works through these NGOs, but in doing so, stretches the level of public speech that the Assad regime was prepared to accept. And I'll just go into, just briefly describe the kind of work he was doing in the countryside. Uh, they would work with a particular village for a three month period. They would go there and just begin with theater games. Um, posing questions, very simple questions about their past, and then increasingly more difficult questions until people became accustomed to narrating their life in relationship to problems that have to be solved. From these, they would begin to structure images. They say, okay, what you described, let's make, it, let's make an image out of it. And from these images, they would begin to construct very simple dramas. Then the rest of the troupe would come in after this three-month period, and they would look at these dramas, and they would write a play based on the experiences of the of the uh, members of the community. They would then stage that play, but they would include um, a figure that comes out of Bawal's writing, the Joker figure, who was responsible for stopping the play at key moments and asking the audience to intervene and to change what was taking place, and even encouraging the audience members to take the place of actors and perform the play in a different way. So you can imagine that this was not what uh, Firdos had imagined when they said, okay, we can, you can do these pieces around uh, marital relations and polygamy. Um, it was um, essentially um, training a critical mass of audience members who then felt able to debate and intervene in the public. So <clears throat> such forum theater projects fundamentally undermine a central strategy of the Assad regime and the ruling Ba'ath Party, the Ba'athification of the public sphere. The selective tolerance, is, so it's not that they want to eliminate the public sphere, but they want to bathify it. Um, they want to create a series of NGOs that are fronts that, for the government that allow them to kind of channel these efforts into creating a civil society. Forum theater, with its emphasis on spontaneity, repeated questioning, and communal scripting, threatens to disrupt this stage management of society. And not surprisingly, Firdos withdrew his, um, their, their support. Eventually, in the longer paper, I go into how he got permission to work in juvenile detention centers with children, but again, it's about framing it as personal rehabilitation. It's not a social project, it's about rehabilitating this particular individual. Then again, once the work was, became visible, um, the um, government pulled its support and they weren't allowed to continue doing that. Of course, in the Civil War, it, then in the Civil War, he starts doing a series of political works, probably the most famous is this piece, Please Look Into the Camera, in which they interviewed people who had been detained and tortured in the, in the uprising, and they created a play out of these verbatim pieces. They fictionalized the pieces, so it isn't actually verbatim theater. Um, since, this year, since 2013, he's been working with refugees. Um, the first project, the one that I'm gonna talk about here, is a devised piece based on Euripides' play, The Trojan Women. In that production, the development process privileges the performers grappling with their own personal experiences through the medium of Euripides' play, rather than focuses on the play text. Only a very small portion of the play is actually performed, and instead, the group uses passages from the play to reflect upon their own experience. And the, the women who took part shaped and decided um, the content of this work. Um, so the staging choices elevate the actor's personal experience over Euripides. Speeches of characters are confined to video projections. Half the screen shows a woman facing the camera, the other half a woman in profile. The woman facing the camera um, begins by identifying herself, her actual name, stating her age, and then she goes on to explain how it is that a particular play, character in the play resembles her. Um, she says, for example, in this, in this um, passage, Hecuba's sense of loss becomes an occasion for the actor to remark that 17 years ago, I too desired death and felt that a taste of bitterness would linger in my mouth to the end of my days, no matter how long I lived. However, she explains, that changed with the great joy that entered her life, naming her children and her husband. So the, Hecuba's text is not an occasion to reflect on my experience as a refugee. Hecuba's text is an occasion for me to reflect on how I have overcome adversity. And then the figure in profile 
delivers a very brief portion of Hecuba's text, but Euripides becomes the tool for the, the, the woman's own self-discovery. Um, and they go through all the characters this way at different points, uh, Hecuba, Cassandra, Andromach, um, that women, that there'll be passages about the burning of Troy in which it's occasions for women to remember their memories of, uh, to, to relate their memories of living in Syria. So the projected segments on stage, I mean the projected segments on the screen alternate um, between loss and joyful memories, but they largely focus on life before civil war. In between these projections, there's live performance. There is individuals who sit stock still before a microphone and recount their flight. Um, all of these are stories of flight. Um, and then these are interspersed with very brief choral odes from the play. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so a middle-aged woman sits stilly, hands on lap, speaking into a microphone, describing crossing back into Syria on learning that her mother had descended into a coma. She delays her return to Amman, and days after her mother's death, masked men break into the home, throwing her young nephews to the floor and threatening to haul them off unless her brother Muhammad agrees to come peacefully. She describes crossing back into Jordan and lading later receiving the phone call from her sister. Muhammad is dead. How? We don't know. The Red Cross found him in the street naked. The bullet entered from his mouth. She concludes her remaining brothers went to the hospital to identify the body and then brought it home for burial. Um, and then I go into other, other of these instances. The, the, the important thing is the juxtaposition of linguistic registers. Um, because these performances of life are delivered in the Syrian dialect. The video speeches of the characters and the live choral odes, by contrast, are delivered in classical Arabic with rhythmic delivery. By contrast, the live reminiscences are delivered in a Syrian dialect, the language of the everyday. The pauses and ellipses, the apparent effect of human frailty rather than performance choices. The choral odes were performed with group stylized movement or tableau staging. In the reminiscences, a single woman sat before the microphone. The artistry of staging Euripides' texts rendered the stillness of the reminiscences that much more immediate, further underscoring its status as real as opposed to the theatrical. As much as the stories of atrocities grab our attention, the production is careful to present them as one way of remembering the past. A woman might reflect on a line by Hecuba and use it as a springboard to a childhood memory of life as a tomboy and being mistaken for a boy. Lines about smoldering Troy prompt a memory of a class trip to a museum in Tartus, the most beautiful moment in, the young woman, in a young woman's life. The complexity and different experiences of life as refugees is emphasized in the production's closing sequence. Thanks. Eight different women come forward to read letters they have composed to loved ones far away. A mother congratulates her daughter on her recent wedding, and only the mother's delivery betrays her pain at being absent. A woman writes to her aunt relating the joy of being reunited with her separated son. The performance ends with a young woman who writes to her mother with one of these fictional letters about the stress relocation has put on her marriage. The remarkable honesty of this last letter reveals a courage equal to, though entirely different from, that of the woman who narrates learning of her brother's death. And the project one gathers was productive of the courage it dramatized. Now, in my analysis, in my longer analysis, I really present, I, I think this work is skirting the edge of objection that the choral odes are these outpourings that spill over into lament. And there's a specific staging choice to undermine our ability to recognize who is speaking. They're done in dim lights or in darkness. They're done with a character hidden and everyone mouthing words simultaneously. They're, um, they're done with all of the actors just kind of walking around the space speaking simultaneously. There, the, the stuff of life as 
a refugee is always threatening to spill over beyond the possibility of control of language into the space of objection. And you know, Kristeva talks about objection as this experience that separates our entry into the realm of the symbolic from the primordial real, when we are unable to differentiate. That in order for us to become individuals, we must leave the, the real, but we are also at danger of slipping back into the, the space of the real. And it seems to me that the, the refugee, and perhaps part of the reason that there really hasn't been a sufficient response to the refugee crisis, whereas you know there was an outpouring of money for Haiti and the like, there's always much more difficulty raising money for refugees. It's precisely because the refugee, like the corpse in Christopher's writing, marks the fragility of our national belonging, that it demonstrates both the boundaries of the nation, but how how permeable those nations are, and how easily it is to be forced back into this other space. And so it seems to me that there may be a way of theorizing such drama therapy projects as a way of also rethinking the nation going forward. And Omar Abdusada continues to do this work. He's in Damascus right now working with displaced teens on a new project. Um, and in some ways, I think of him as kind of trying to heal the nation, one cast and one audience at the time. Thanks. I think we'll do the same and take three questions at a time. Ah, uh, yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I have a question to Leila, and it's kind of a theoretical question. Uh, how do you know the difference between militant optimism and cruel optimism? Uh, I'm not in the lunch. Cruel optimism, that is optimism which kills, destroys, exhausts the subject. Uh, and when does militant optimism become cruel optimism? Thank you. Oh, we're going to take a second. Right. Yes. Adam? One question for Walter. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple, uh, one question for Tara and one question for Walter. Or actually, uh, um, probably an, an idea for Walter. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really interesting approach that, uh, that you brought forth in, in conceptualizing Adil Imam. And I'm really glad that you presented the two sort of registers uh, in, in, his sort of, uh, in his long uh, and very arduous and, and turbulent uh, sort of legacy. Um, there's, I think the two periods really come to a real confrontation in a very particular interview that he gave to one of, uh, and, it, and it was an extended interview that he gave with one of the private satellite stations uh, in the accompaniment of Saeed Saleh, who is his co-actor in, uh, in several major productions, but most, most importantly uh, in Madras um, al-Mushaghibin, uh, uh, where they both, uh, but Madrasim Sharbin, they were discuss, actually discussing Madrasim Sharbin as as a as a narrative. Uh, it was in 1967. I mean, shortly after the the war in 1967, and Adil Imam was completely quiet about the the dissident oppositional uh, discussions that that this particular anti-authoritarian uh, Masrahiya represented. Where, whereas on the other hand. Uh, you had Saeed Saleh coming out and saying no. It represented a very critical juncture. And so in a way, it was Adil Imam absol either absolving or dissociating himself from a long sort of legacy of, of anti-authoritarianism. So I think that was a really critical turning point. And a lot of people in Egypt recognized that Adil Imam was no longer the Adil Imam of, of yesteryear. So I think that's an inter interesting point. But I, um, I think I, I found it very interesting. I just want to add. Um, sort of a, a, an, a call to sort of historicize and to situate and to contextualize the discussion within a particular uh, geographic milieu. Um, I'm not familiar with any context uh, inside Qatar where there's either a virtual sort of activism or, or a, an attempt to, to mobilize uh, in such a way. So I'm curious, beyond the, the register, which you did a spectacular job uh, representing, if, if this is um, something that is either state sanctioned or I, I don't mean state sanctioned in the official sense, but how do these things happen in an environment where there's typically very little uh, you know, mobilization of the sort or at least an attempt to kind of memorialize uh, success against uh, sort of a, a larger discourse? Yeah, that's technically three questions, but we can have a third questioner. <laughs> Very quickly, actually, to pick up on um, Adel, uh, the question about Adel Imam for, uh, for Walter, 
Um, um, my question is, is really um, uh, um, about the general career of Adel Imam and the politics of his art, I mean film and, and uh, plays, um, which is, as Adel said, anti-authoritarian in essence, from Madras to Mushagibin for me to even a Zayim. I mean, I remember in Tunisia, uh, in the days following the revolution, Nasma TV, which is a private channel, was playing a Zaim every day. <laughs> so, uh, so that that was taken as really the symbol of you know uh, of anti-authoritarianism. But then you know the fall of grace of Adli Imam as as a person, as 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 an actor and as an Egyptian citizen, which happened in Egypt and also in the uh, lar in the uh, larger uh, Arab world, especially you know following the Algeria Egypt um, national. Uh, teams playing soccer in 2009, where Adli Imam came out and said, you know, the Egyptians, who are they? They do not speak Arabic. I mean, they're fran Francophone, and you know, he, st he started on his rant against uh, against Egyptian, and that was the moment where, you know, oh, um, Algerian, sorry. Um, so I I'm just wondering about that. Um, the other, uh, really, two comments. One for um, Leila about um, the the two songs. I mean, can we just call them? Uh, a parody, the second song is, is a parody. I mean, in Arabic, there is a word, muwarda, which means because really going um, um, word by word and reversing the words. Uh, and so th this is a really a very classical, fo classical trope that is used, uh, especially in poetry. And then, uh, um, very quickly, uh, for Tara, which is also, I'm looking at the, the way that uh, al Bishr responded. Uh, to the Ghazwa, she, she uses the word Ghazwa hashtag. That's an exomeron, uh, almost, you know, uh, Ghazwa hashtag. She's actually also using a very archaic, uh, you know, uh, concept and a very modern one. So I'm just wondering about, about that. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Yachim, for that um, question, and we can talk more about it perhaps during lunch, but I'll just very briefly say that um, in terms of, if, if Berlant's notion of cruel optimism is really interested in the way that um, there is a desire for an object that is ultimately not good for, for the person, um, I think that what would be really a really important distinction, distinction is that in, in the framework of militant optimism, there's not actually an object desire. The notion of a forward dawning is, a, is something that doesn't actually focus on a particular object, per se. Um, for Adel, the context, I mean, we can talk about it in a larger, also, golf context and, you know, hacking of authors' Twitter accounts like Abdul Khal, um, but also arrest of people who are tweeting, uh, Kashkari, I mean, there are a lot of examples. But in the Qatari context spe uh, specifically, you also have this, this is part of, you know, this... Uh, Kind of ethnic, uh, this, this Qatarization, Naza, you know, this, this the idea is why we bring people from outside. So there is a form of kind of chauvinism that's not encouraged by the state or openly, but it is also, this is a situation where the National University actually caves in, and after this, they were much more, they're much more afraid to do things because, you know, that was set the precedence in a sense of caving into these kind of very kind of conservative attacks against, you know, the foreign in all its, uh, you know, in all, all its shapes. And, uh, and yeah, but the, for, this is precisely what I think is interesting, is that this Ghaz with hashtag, so, so, you know, the Jahiliya is a cyber, cyber portal for, for the Jahiliya as a, as a fantasy, uh, you know, as a fiction. Which I think is is very interesting, and and the ghazu and the maghza is also about meaning production that is both extremely con modern but also extremely tied to uh, kind of a pre-Islamic or early Islamic fantasy of of tribal warfare, and how these anxieties are actually accentuated, mobilized um, um, through these uh, Twitter campaign and exchanges. Um, I, I'd quite like to ask you, Adel, when was that interview broadcast? I just want to find it. It Okay. I mean, in, in, in the general sense, I mean, I think that the turning point in Adel Imam's career was 1992. I mean, it was everything he made after he started working with Wahid Hamid 
um, and uh, Ehud Habu Kebab was um, a move away from his earlier persona of being anti-authoritarian. And when a given person picks up on that, probably varies from one person to another. I mean, I would assume that not everybody saw the interview that you're referring to. And um, you know, for some people, it might have crystallized something that was already in the air for a long time. But I mean, what I mean to say is that it was an opportunity for him to take advantage of the mainstream and it was one of the one of the extremely long interviews that he gave. So it was and he saw it in a, in a brief sort of reflection, uh, and it, it sort of illustrated the extent to which he had become so distant from mm -hmm. this, this this period, and was completely silent for almost ten minutes. As I saw it, explained that how uh, Western he was a dissident, of course, and he refused to even express himself non verbally. So it wasn't about production. I'm not talking about this cultural production per se, but rather this really sort of jarring moment where I don't is not talking about dissent in any way, shape, or form. It's on YouTube? Yes, it's on okay. YouTube. <laughs> no. Noor? So I'm happy we have space for one question. Thank you, firstly, for an excellent number of presentations. But I have a question for uh, Walter, but it's also based on a conversation I was having with Edward over breakfast, which is, you talk of, there's a very political economic element to the conversation you're starting on Adil Imam, which is the fact that these, uh, the change in his stance towards the government also echoed the neoliberal reforms that were go going on at the time. And I wonder whether you have anything to note on, and this echoes something we were discussing on Dorid Laham as well, who also had a very anti-authoritarian view and then suddenly sort of sided with the government more. How do you think the application of neoliberal reforms, and specifically their application on a media sphere and the commercialization of media, affects how the media voices their opinions and how these characters you know, place themselves as, as anti-authoritarian or are they placated by becoming rich, really? <laughs> Yes. Um, should we take more questions, or do you want me to answer? Uh, right I think away. we're taking three and then answering. So I have a question for Laila. Thank you so much for the presentation. And um, the the question of optimism and the, also traces to the question asked by Joaquin. First, what is the difference between uh, militant optimism and carnivalistic moment? Okay, what was the second one? carnivalistic carnivalistic moment. Uh, that permitted the Arab Spring and Arab revolts in Egypt. For uh, in the case of Egypt, there was many similar moments. They shared the same lightness, uh, the same uh, tragic prospect, the same uh, problematics about how future is opened in that moment. Just curious question, okay? And the other the other thing is related to how to narrate this moment. Okay, when when historians just came to my mind when we uh, have this moment, moments of uh, militant optimism that open potentialities and possibilities for different future can be remembered later on, can be maybe remembered as uh, tragic moments, unfulfilled promises, or is, it's about how, how they are settled in a temporal narrative later on. Thank you. Okay, I think the panelists should answer those. And then we'll stop. Um, the, the, the political economic element in um, the work of Adli Mem, the question is how did neoliberal reforms affect the anti-authoritarian status of, of actors? Did I understand correctly? Well, 
I mean, he's, he's not anti-authoritarian by the time he starts picking up on those kinds of reforms. I mean, sometime in the 1990s he changed, and initially it was when he signed on to government campaigns against Islamists. Um, although, I think if you go back and see some of his films from then, you can also see um, a, a kind of reconciliation with, uh, with the, the status quo in the political economy. I mean, if you look at, you know, starting with Elud Habib Kebab, um, and then Elud Habib, and, and then after that, the films that he made with Wahid Hamid. Um, I mean, the films that he made previous to that in the 1980s were rather bleak by comparison. They didn't really offer any solution to the growing chasm between rich and poor that um, was characteristic of the early years and the later years of the Infitah. Um, but you can start to see a kind of reconciliation with that, with the, with the work. I mean, it's not as obvious as the um, signing on to the anti-Islamist campaign. But then if you look at, the, again, if you just look at his body of work, um, what he's making after the 2000s, um, by that time he's getting old. And, you know, he basically is, instead of being the sort of anti-authoritarian young man lashing out against author authority, he becomes the man who's made it. Um, and he starts appearing in the new neighborhoods and so forth. Um, but the, the, I mean, the point of selling out, if there was such a thing, if it, if it was conscious, came you know, much earlier in the 1990s, I think. Um, so somebody else recently suggested to me this question of whether or not the, uh, the revolution can be thought of as a, as, a, as a carnivalistic moment. And this is something I'm still thinking through, so it's, I'm not, I don't have a very clear answer. But um, one of the things that um, occurs to me is sort of one of the things I'm thinking about is kind of the, the way in which the performances of the, rev of the revolution um, don't do a chronological I, you know, narrative. And, um, so I'm sort of wondering whether the how how do we mark the end of a carnivalistic moment in terms of a, of a revolution because there's not a reversion to past structures or to normal structures. So these are some some of the things I'm still thinking through. Um, and then the question about how these moments are remembered later, I think, is is apt and is will be part of the larger project that is um, a series of oral histories about these performances. So those things will come through certainly. Okay, thank you. I think it's time for lunch.